So I guess the first thing that you'll notice about this desk is that the master section is not in the traditional bay 3 position. We've actually moved it to the bay 4 position. It's actually reasonably easy to do because, of course, the whole desk runs on an Ethernet backbone. So we can literally swap the modules over in the lower two sections and just remap the desk. That bit's actually really easy to do. The tricky bit is the master monitor screen because the cable for the master monitor is, sort of ends about here. So what we ended up having to do is get a custom-made cable that extends the monitor over to here to the right. That was the tricky bit. Finding the parts was really difficult. But Avid will give you, if you ask nicely, the pinout configuration so you can build your own. Why have we done that? Well, the reason is that the sound operator stands over here to work. They've got the main show control screen here and the VCAs here, and the script goes here. When we first started using the desk with the sound operator here, we ended up having to have the script sitting over this end bay. And of course, that wipes out eight faders and makes it that much tighter for the sound designer to be working over here. So with the help of Avid, we modified the desk and it's now much better from a musical theatre point of view because it allows two people to work much easier. When it comes to laying out the console, one of the key things I try to do is to try to keep it constant between shows. So I like to try and make sure that the vocal reverbs and band reverbs, sound effects returns, various different things are all generally in the same order and generally in the same position from show to show. That means that when me and my team are moving from venue to venue, we don't have to go looking through 192 channels to try and work out where the vocal reverb is. I can be reasonably confident, for example, that the band reverb is going to be on channel one and two, regardless of what show I go to. When I work out what my input layout's going to be, I tend to think about it in terms of the master screen. So we spend an awful lot of our time working from the console remotely. So during tech period, during rehearsals, during previews, I'll spend a lot of time sitting at my production desk remotely connected into the console via VNC, or during shows, sitting in the middle of the audience with the VNC connection open on my laptop. For that reason, we tend to lay out the inputs based on what we see here on the screen. So the first one to 64, I'll try to get all the band stuff on. 65 to 128, I'll try to get all the vocal stuff on. 129 to 192, I'll put all the other stuff. That way, when I'm working here on the, on the screen, it all makes logical sense. So we'll drop in blanks to break things up. So we'll do drums and percussion, then drop a blank in, then put guitars, then drop a blank in, helping to navigate around on this screen. We tend to look at that purely in terms of what we're looking at on the screen and not pay any attention to how that layout would look in the inputs mode of the surface. So then when it comes to the layout of the surface, we ignore the inputs tab and use the layouts configuration to set up a layout on the surface that makes sense to the surface. It doesn't have to make sense to the screen, it makes sense to the surface. So the screen makes sense to VNC and the layouts on the surface makes sense when you're standing behind the desk. So we have a drums layout, a track layout, band layout, percussion, boys, girls, principals, various different layouts here on the surface that make sense when you're standing behind it. Those layouts aren't just inputs, they include groups, auxiliaries, sometimes a matrix output, and additional VCAs. By default, we keep eight VCAs in Banksafe. These are the faders that the operator needs to be able to get to at all times to be able to mix the show. They never change. Doesn't matter what layout you go to, they're always safe, they're always in every layout, just in case anything gets knocked out of Banksafe, and they're there sitting in Banksafe. On top of that, we have two more VCAs, that also sit here bank safe at the end and they are two extra VCAs that are for the music mixing side of it. So this 10 faders here never move, always bank safe, always there available for the sound operator. The rest of the console changes on a layout by layout basis to suit whatever it is you need to get to. So if we just have a quick look here at the drums page, pretty traditional kick snare, stick, hi-hat, toms, overheads and uh, some drum pads. We've also, on all of the band layouts, I've put the band reverbs here in these two slots, and actually, on all of the vocal layouts, I put the vocal reverb stuff down here, just so that if you know you're on a band layout, you always know where your band reverbs are. Then, in the additional space down the end of this drum layout, I've got the drum room auxiliary send, so I can see exactly what is sending to the drum room. I've got the stereo group, so that I, for the drums, 
and I also have a mono group for the drums, which I'll explain in a bit. Uh, we also have a drums auxiliary that's dedicated to subs. So the drums themselves have a drum stereo group, a drum mono group, and a drum subgroup. And those are up there on the end, quick and easy to just be able to see what members are which, and if we want to do any EQ directly on the group. So with regard to groups, I tend to do a stereo group and a mono group. And the reason for doing this is I put everything into both groups. So the entire drum kit goes to drum stereo and it goes to drums mono. But then when it comes to feeding the main PA system, I feed all the mono sources from drums mono and all of the stereo sources from drum stereo. My logic for that is, most of the time, you want the full drum kit in the main PA, you want it in the center cluster, you want it in the delays, you want it everywhere. You want the drums in the whole system. But there's the occasional moment where what you actually want to do is do some really brutal panning. And if you've got drums, say you want to do a big sweeping tom roll, like a really big feature, if the, if the toms are also in the mono sources, either in all the delays, they're in the center clusters, you don't get the sweeping panning moment that you do if you temporarily drop the drums out of the mono. So what I'll do is I'll automate the group sends for the toms and literally put a couple of cues in and go, okay, we're going to sweep through, we're going to do a big drum roll through the toms, and for that moment I will drop the toms out of the mono groups so that we get full stereo and we get a bigger sweeping effect. So with the introduction of the new layout, stuff with the S6L. My original plan was going to be that we were going to have what I called a mix layer and the mix layer was going to be recorded on a scene by scene basis and was going to include whatever was useful in any given snapshot to, for the operator to be able to quickly grab. What we've actually ended up doing is giving the sound operator the eight VCAs that they need to mix the show, then two more programmable VCAs where we drop specific band information onto. So for example, if we have a song with lots of guitar solos, we'll drop guitar onto VCA1 and maybe keyboards onto VCA2 so that those can be quickly and easily grabbed just to do little pushes and pulls without interfering with the rest of the desk. So what we've actually ended up using layer one for is a sort of page for useful mixing tools. So we've ended up adding another 10 VCAs that include the traditional rock and roll elements, brass reeds, guitar one, guitar two, and that quickly and easily allows the sound operator to just reach over and push the kick drum or push the drums for certain moments. Um, it's not a particularly common thing to do in musical theatre, but we've ended up doing it on Bat Out of Hell because it's a rock musical and it felt appropriate. One of the fundamental principles of musical theatre sound is that we try to only have the minimum number of microphones on at any given time. That's down to the fact that the cast are all wearing omnidirectional microphones. Often, although not in the case of this show, those microphones are hidden up at the hairline, which means if you've got two or three people interacting with each other on stage doing dialogue, the phase cancellations between those microphones make the sound very thin, very brittle, and actually quite unpleasant. To counteract that, there is the long-established, well-developed principle of line-by-line -line mixing, which literally means if Rob and I are having a conversation, Rob will say, hello Gareth, how are you? And I'll say, I'm very well, thanks Rob, how are you? Yeah, not bad. Traffic to get here this morning was horrible. Automated VCAs make this process achievable. To be honest, without automated VCAs and automated mutes, I think you'd be hard pushed to do it, except possibly on the smallest of shows. So what we're doing here is in this particular scene, we have two characters, Strat and Raven on VCA 1 and 2, and then we have the boys ensemble, the girls ensemble on VCA 6 and 7, and the band master on VCA 8. As we step through cues within the song, the sound operator will hit the go button, and those VCA members will change. So we've still got Strat and Raven here, but we've now got Falco, Sloan, Jaguar moving on to their own VCAs. Hit the go button again, and those members of those VCAs change. So we're now mixing Amy, Ledoux, and Jaguar Amy's moved out of the girls group and onto her own VCA because she's got a solo line. So we've got boys and girls singing here, Jaguar doing solo lines, Blake, the do, Amy, hit go again. Amy's gone, she's moved back to the girls group, the do's moved to there, we've got Falco on a handheld. So when we're setting up the show, we use the whole desk constantly. We're constantly digging into everything, EQ, dynamics, plugins, getting it all set up, getting it all programmed. Once the show's up and running, 
Sound design has gone away, left the sound operators to look after the show, running it on a night by night basis. In a dream ideal world, the sound operators would never have to go away from the VCAs. Everything should be exactly the same as it was the night before, and they're literally doing their job, mixing the show, happy as. The reality is, of course, that last night the cast went out drinking, they drank too much vodka, today they don't have any voices. So you start the show and you're like, okay, I'm gonna need a little bit more gain on Tinkerbell, Zahara, she's screaming today. Uh, oh, and it seems like we have, a, we have an understudy flute player in today, and he's much louder, so I'm gonna gain those down and actually I need to brighten that up a bit. So these changes happen on a show-by-show -show basis, not to change the show, but to make whatever changes are necessary to maintain the show. Um, and the goal should be that the sound designer will leave the show on opening night, come back two months later and the show should sound exactly the same, regardless of whether there's different people in the orchestra pit or indeed cast members who are ill, understudy cast members, etc, etc.